Hello all. The last time we met, we discussed about the density of states, and then we derived, under all conditions, particularly in degenerate semiconductors, the carrier density n is given by this expression. Uh, two pi m e star k t by h bar square. by 2 and f of ec right a similar expression was derived or could be derived for the holes as well ep 1 minus right this is not h bar this is a mistake i often make many people do make as well right so here we have used something called me which is the effective mass of electrons and effective mass of holes pretty loosely so we will deal with that idea of effective mass here a little bit in more detail okay so today or now we will talk about the idea of effective mass So this effective mass by itself is an approximation. Right? So we have seen this being used in the case of a block electron where effective mass is used to uh, transform uh, a free electron gas a free electron into an electron in a lattice where we said the energy dispersion is m star because it is in a periodic potential. Right? But in this case we are talking about an effective mass for density of states. There is a different effective mass for transport, there is a different effective mass for uh, for a block electron, but now we are talking about the effective mass for density of states. For density of states, okay. So in this particular case, let us take an example of silicon, right. So silicon has this kind of a structure. It has a heavy hole, it has a light hole, and the valence band, sorry, and the conduction band has some, some kind of a weird shape, okay. I am not drawing very, very, very precisely, so uh, forgive me for that. So this is EG, which is indirect band gap semiconductor, right, and this is the, this is the, uh, uh, this has a lower slope so it is a heavier uh, hole so this is called as a heavy hole and this is a light hole right depending upon the uh, the slope in the e versus scale thing we can determine the mass which is inverse of this right so in this particular scenario let's just take silicon so silicon has actually six equivalent uh, conduction band dips which is equally close to the valence band top point here I'm just drawing in this particular simple 2D plot, but if I draw the actual 3D picture, there are six uh, dips like this. So basically, all the calculations that we have done, the um, the uh, density of states calculation should be multiplied by six because each one of them are equally are, are equally uh, uh, probable to be filled, right? So so this n whatever that we have defined should actually be 2 into mc where mc is equivalent number of bands right into whatever that we have actually defined 2 pi blah 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 right f of ec in addition to that right, we have used the me which is the effective mass right the effective mass is the slope is the slope of this curve right but then it is found for silicon that the uh, the equi energy uh, surface right is, is is an ellipsoid so what happens is the let us take an ellipsoid here it has two different masses one is called as the longitudinal effective mass and there are equivalent transfer selective mass effective mass right so the for the conduction band the actual effective mass will now turn out to be some geometric mean of this
right so that's why for a silicon this is the, this is precisely for a silicon silicon has this ellipsoidal uh, equi energy surface which makes it to have an effective mass of the conduction band to be defined like this so what people generally do right in its definition of uh, nc that is uh, number of uh, uh, density of effective density of states of a uh, uh, of, of the conduction band so basically you write nc is uh, 2 2 pi m e star k t by by h bar by what by h square right 3 by 2 this is your uh, effective density of states right? here this eme is basically made to accommodate for the number of bands so basically me star is written as mc power 2 by 3 into mt square ml power 1 by 3 you can easily see that if I if I substitute this to this particular equation, I get the MC out as the number of uh, bands, and this being the geometric mean for the uh, for uh, for the different dispersion in the ellipsoid. Right. Now that we have the same thing for uh, now that we have something for the conduction band, you can do the same thing for the valence band as well. We see the valence band has two, right? the heavy hole and the light hole it does not have degeneracy in the bands so basically the uh, the valence band effective mass is defined as m light hole right star of 3 by 2 plus m heavy hole star of 3 by 2 everything power 2 by 3 now if you substitute this to the previous expression that we have put that is the same thing comes for um, mp right so basically you will see that you will have two terms giving you the reason the reason behind two terms there are because there are two bands which are degenerated at uh, k is equal to zero one being light hole and navy hole each of them giving m power three by two right so this is the uh, definition for an effective mass for the density of states which follows from the fact that the density of states has a mass power 3 by 2 relation right so depending upon the number of bands that you have and the shape of the band that you have you have a geometric mean depending upon the shape and you have just a summation for all the number of degeneracies that you have right so we will uh, we will we will see another effective mass when we discuss about conductivity there we will see how each one of them vary and what is the effective mass numbers and so forth for now we will stop the discussion on the effective mass and then proceed towards the case for an intrinsic semiconductor so we have seen till now the definition for a band gap why do you why do you ha even have a band gap right and you see that if the band gap is small enough in comparison to the temperature then you call it a semiconductor because you can actually excite an electron from the balance band to the conduction band right so let us take another simplified example of a band structure you have a valence band here you have a conduction band on the top right and at zero kelvin you have the valence band completely filled and your Fermi function looks something like this as we have previously seen now as you increase the temperature right, you can elevate some of the electrons in the valence band to the conduction band and this depends upon the temperature right? at higher and higher temperature you can do more and more and at some situation you have a portion of the conduction band filled and the portion of the valence band empty and you always have in the valence band more number of electrons than vacancies right and hence let us say we take a, a material like this and you say a, a, a major portion of them are filled with one kind of particles right it's the electrons now you have a small portion of it which is filled by holes now even if this if it is these electrons which are actually doing the motion 
you will actually have a feel that it is these uh, uh, vacancies which are moving and moving in the sea or in the background of this large population of electrons. It is what that makes us to have a feel that the holes are actually moving even even though that in the valence band it is the electron which is only moving right you have only electrons which are actually particles in this particular picture so without going into a lot of such detail we see that in the intrinsic semiconductor or in a semiconductor where you have equal number of electrons and holes n is equal to p where n is the number of electrons in the conduction band p is the vacancies or holes in the valence band you can see that it has to be same because the uh, because of the conservation of the particles right you create a vacancy in the valence band forming uh, an electron in the conduction band eventually giving you an n is equal to p relationship so here we call this number as ni where i is called the intrinsic digit so an intrinsic semiconductor is one in which you have equal number of electrons and the holes right and at thermal equilibrium you have a constant number of electrons and holes depending upon the temperature at which it is set and in such situations you always have generation that is you have an excitation of an electron from the valence band to the conduction band as well as you have what is called as a recombination where the electrons just fall down from the conduction band to the valence band right? the rate at which you generate let's call it gi should be equal to the rate at which it's recombined we call it as ri in the when when there is thermal equilibrium right it is pretty straightforward because the numbers n, n and p are constant at thermal equilibrium and this recombination has to have an electron and hole right so basically it is it has to be proportional to n into p where n and p are uh, the uh, equilibrium concentration of electron hole and which we know is alpha n i square so at equilibrium the generation rate and recombination rate should be proportional to the n i square when n i is equal to n or p which is called as the intrinsic area density right so let us replace whatever that we uh, that we have calculated till now so we saw that n is equal to p equal to n i in the intrinsic case And we know that n equal to n c e power e f minus e c by k t, and we know p is n v valence band, right? E power e v minus e f by k t. Right. So this being given, we can actually take a natural logarithm and divide one by the other. we can come up with an expression for the fermi level so ef will turn out to be ec plus ev by 2 plus kt by 2 long nv by let's see so what it kind of tells us is in the intrinsic case where n is equal to p right your ef is equal to ec plus ev so this is the this is ec right and this is ev it is a mean of ec plus ev it lies between ec and ev plus some ratio of number of states in the uh, the effective density of states in valence band and conduction band in typical semiconductors these two values are not fairly different so this number will be negligible in comparison to this so in an intrinsic semiconductor you have your fermi level very close to the middle region of or the uh, arithmetic mean of the conduction and valence band energy levels Right. you can actually um, uh, substitute these values and eventually you will get something like ec plus ev by 2 plus 3 by 4 kt ln mos right this when you substitute your mc and nc i mean nv and mc on similar lines we saw in the previous definition that n into p equal to n i square right and again if we substitute both of them together we will see that it is n c n b e power minus uh, e c minus e v by k t which will come out to be 
ENC, NB, E power minus, EG by KT. Which if you replace uh, it, its values, you will find it is for the scribble at the end but however the important point to be noted here is that the the actual density that is uh, ni square or uh, the product of n into p or uh, it's just uh, the uh, the density of carriers in an intrinsic semiconductor depends to the power of third uh, t power 3 by 2 and e power minus g so and is inversely proportional to the band gap so the larger the band gap smaller is the intrinsic carrier density and higher the temperature higher is the intrinsic carrier density i would like to uh, show this by uh, by a plot which is experimentally uh, determined you can see that uh, on the y axis we have the intrinsic carrier density this is the intrinsic carrier density and the x-axis is inverse of temperature so if you see that as the temperature increases from right to left you can see that the carrier density increases almost linearly sorry and gallium and uh, gallium arsenide having the highest band gap between the three has the smallest carrier density right so with this uh, with this treatment of uh, carrier density intrinsic carrier density and its difference between the uh, different semiconductors we stop here and the next time we meet let us talk about extrinsic semiconductors thank you